Rockin' a Monday, and you know what that means. <clears throat> it's time to clear my throat, because it's time for another exciting episode, episode of Taxi TV Live. Ah! There they are. <laughs> That's what I love about doing this show. We are nothing if not professional. <laughs> There's the audience. Yeah! Let's see the real audience in the chat room. There they are. Hi, guys. How you doing? Asaf, you're in there. I hope I, I'm pronouncing that correctly. Did you get the microphone that you won on the last episode? I hope it made it there. Um, let's see. Who else do we have? Ann House, Vicky Flaw with. Vicky. Thank you. Thank you so much for that card. I appreciate it. Tell your mom I said thanks, too. Um... Bubbles, how are you? I know I owe Bubbles a return email. Um, that hit my desk on Friday, I believe. Uh, let's see. Mark Davis, how you doing? Kenda Potter, Howling, Howling Ulf. Uh, anyway, hello guys. Hope you all had a great weekend. Um, I ended up working all day yesterday on this 11 pages of notes for today's show. But uh, I also went to the NAMM show. i got to show you guys something pretty cool. Let's see if I can find this in a hurry. Yes, it's that time of the year where the sun is shining through my blinds at a weird time of day. So I went to the NAMM show the other day, just Saturday, for a particular meeting with um, the wonderful folks at Paul Reed Smith PRS Guitars because they were kind enough to give us some beautiful acoustic guitars for the Road Rally open mic sessions this year. And while I was at the booth, none other, let's see if we can get that looking good, not that great. Um, yeah. Anyway, Paul Reed Smith stopped by and I met with him for a couple minutes and got a shot with him. And uh, I said something about, thank you so much. It's not every day you get to take a picture with a legend. And he said, I feel like I'm the one with the legend. I said, really? What would make you say that? And he said, because I've been reading your emails for eons. So, Paul Reed Smith, thank you for reading the emails. Thanks for being on the list. I hope you watch Taxi TV. Um, thank you for loaning us the spectacularly incredible sounding acoustic guitars, which if you guys don't know, it seems like nobody knows this, but PRS actually makes these acoustic guitars that I think retail for like 500 bucks or less that are gorgeous. I would have thought these things were like $1,200 to $2,000. I am not kidding. The craftsmanship was gorgeous. They sounded beautiful. Um, people at the Road Rally loved them. And they were like five, I think one of them was 515 bucks was the sticker on it or street price, I don't know, whatever. Bottom line is PRS makes really good sounding, really incredible looking um, acoustic guitar. So check those out. All right, without any further ado, I'm going to jump right into the show for today. Um, Jesse plays PRS Electric. Uh, yeah, they're, oh God, they're electric stuff. They have guitars there that were up to like $40,000, $60,000. But I mean, even their two, $3,000 electrics, every one of them is like a, a work of art. So why success with music is easier today than ever before. Um, during last November's Road Rally, and yes, I'm working from 11 pages of notes, so you'll see me looking down a lot today. One of the things I noticed during the keynote interview was that even though the fees to composers and supervisors have gone down, there are more opportunities now than ever before. That was mentioned, um, I think, by myself and by a couple of the panelists. So when I started Taxi in 1992, success in the music business for artists generally meant that you either got signed or you didn't. Um, if you did get signed, either had a hit record or you didn't. Um, for songwriters, success was having a top 10 or a number one hit. You either did or you didn't. You know, having like a 97 didn't really count or not charting at all, definitely not good. So success is pretty much a zero sum game. Let me see how my volume is doing. It was pretty much a, a zero sum game, you know, very uh, kind of black and white, either were successful or you weren't. That was it. And I think a lot of people assumed that um, I, I'm not going to try. I, I think that a lot of people today still think I'm not going to try because what are the chances of me having, a, you know, like a top 10 country hit? What are the chances of me signing a record deal? Um, 
So people just don't even try. And then they think, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, they've heard there's so much bad information out there. Not that uh, what I'm about to say is necessarily bad or wrong information. But I think that a lot of people think that they're going to get screwed if they work with a record label. And look, record labels are in business to make money, but they only make money if they are making you successful. And while you won't sell many um, downloads these days or CDs, that's for sure, um, some artists always break through and those artists get big enough vis-a-vis -vis radio airplay and YouTube and whatever else and they end up touring and they end up making just untold amounts of money from that. Not a lot of people, but some new ones always break through. But I think most musicians still hold on to that belief and therefore they just don't bother to get into the game because they think it's an unachievable goal and the odds of having success um, by that old definition are just too great. So um, other musicians try to get into the game, but they don't find success quickly enough. So they just pick up their bat and their ball and they put their tail between their legs and they go home. It's that simple. They're done. So I, I was thinking about success while reflecting on the comments made during that keynote at our convention. And a taxi member named Gary Sridzinski popped into my head. Not the easiest name to remember or pronounce, but it does pop into my head pretty frequently because I love this guy. Um, I've mentioned him on the show before. Gary's far from being the archetypal music business success story. Um, the odds couldn't weigh more heavily against him, actually. For starters, he lives in a tiny town called Kittery Point, Maine. Gorgeous and tiny, and it's about as far away from Hollywood as you can geographically get in the United States. I mean, it's in the other corner of the country, okay? It's very close to the New Hampshire border. Um, it, it, gorgeous. I, I've been there. I actually flew out there and had dinner with the guy and hung out with him, and I, I love him. I mean, Gary is just an awesome human being. But he's not hip. He, he's not a 20-something guy who looks like a rock star. Um, his primary instrument, and get ready for this, is the accordion. Yes, it is the accordion. Gary Sredzinski is a success in the music industry playing the accordion. He's got a band that plays out regularly, um, and he's a successful film and TV composer, often playing nothing more than his accordion. And here are just some of his credits. I don't even know if these are all that updated. I found them on his website, but I have a funny feeling that there are more credits than he has up there. Um, feature films with Paramount, uh, The Bad News Bears with Billy Bob Thornton. Had a song in there. Um, Fox, uh, remember Meet Dave with Eddie Murphy? Had a song in that. Uh, remember the Fox film, The A-Team, the, the redo of The A-Team with Liam Neeson and Bradley Cooper? Had a song in that. Um, remember, this one was a while back, but Love Hurts with Jenna Elfman, Janine Garofalo, and Carrie Ann Moss. That was an indie picture. It did pretty well. He had a song in that. TV. He's had um, something in Hemlock Grove on Netflix. How I Met Your Mother uh, on CBS, um, The Middle on ABC, Gotham on Fox, Unforgettable on CBS, uh, The Love Monkey on MTV slash CBS, uh, Everybody Hates, Hates Chris on uh, CW Network, um, Music in Three Episodes of Chaos on CBS. Excuse me, there was my uh, weekly rock star burp. Um, Let's see, The Philanthropist on NBC, Dirty Sexy Money, whatever happened to that show? That show wasn't so bad, I think it got dropped. Uh, Dirty Sexy Money on ABC, he had a song in there. Brothers and Sisters had something, a uh, promo campaign there. Make It or Break It on ABC Family, um, USA Network, Royal Pains, um, Food Network, uh, Music for a Polish Restaurant in Ham, Ham Tram, I can't even say that word, Ham Tram. Michigan, uh, and Elite DLC video game. He did an ad trailer for Call of Duty. So Gary is one of the sweetest, nicest, most positive, and most grateful taxi members I know. And Gary is successful. Maybe he's not successful by Mick Jagger's definition of success, but he's wildly successful by Gary Sredzinski's definition. Okay, he's doing something he loves and he's incredibly enthusiastic about it. And I mean incredibly enthusiastic in a great way about it. And he's getting paid for doing it all while living in a small house out in the middle of the woods. And I mean, you've got to drive down like a dirt road surrounded by trees on both sides of you 
um, and you get to this adorable little house. I, don't, I think he might have moved. Last time I visited him, the only time I visited with him, he had like this magical little house sitting right on a creek, and he's known as the Creek Man. Uh, Gary puts on a wetsuit, and even in the dead of winter, swims miles a day with a wetsuit on and a mask and a snorkel, uh, at least a mask and a wetsuit, in this saltwater, I believe it's a saltwater creek, because he's got lobsters in there. He's got a collection of uh, um, like World War II and Revolutionary War bottles that he's found in this creek, just all kinds of interesting historical stuff that he's found in the creek. Um, and dear God, don't eat a lobster with Gary. He took me to a lobster joint when we were there, and I had a lobster, and he looked forlorn. I said, what's the matter? He goes, you're eating one of my friends. Gary sees lobsters in the creek, so he's become friendly with them. But Gary lives his, you know, Gary's life on Gary's terms, and he's just a spectacularly great, enthusiastic, and grateful guy. Um, doesn't have a fancy home studio, and he doesn't play a wide range of instruments, Um it may be that he only plays keys. I don't think I saw any stringed instruments in his house. I could be wrong. Um, but if he needs other instruments on a recording, he's got bandmates from his band, The Surfs, and he gets them in to play stuff for other local musicians. If a feature film needs a polka, Gary has it. If a TV show needs a beachy surf rock thing, Gary hammers one out on his accordion and gets placements because he's doing something so different that it stands out. So he may not be a rock star with a house in Beverly Hills and all that kind of stuff, but Gary is awesomely cool, and he's filled with unbridled enthusiasm, and his definition of success is perfect for Gary Sredzinski. So he sent me this email. Um, i got to scroll back down in the chat room there. I, I was looking for something about this, um, about Gary, and I found this email from March 13th of 2012. It's 7.58 p.m., uh, Michael, once again, thanks so much for taxiing the connections I've made. The publisher Taxi hooked me up with is still doing well by me. And then he copied me on an email from the publisher. Just placed your song, Last Demon of Bucharest, in an Activision online trailer ad for Call of Duty. Uh, total fee was 1500 bucks, um, half years when we get payment. Uh, and then... He said, when the art section in our local newspaper used me in a quiz below, it really dawned on me how thankful I am. Uh, I never told the paper about this. So many musicians would just love to get a tune in a movie. So thanks to you, buddy. I'm building quite the resume and realize how cool you've made my life, Michael. Love you, bro. Gary Sredzinski. And then the, this is the actual quiz that was in the local newspaper. Um, which film did not feature an original song by Gary Sredzinski? A, Meet Dave, B, Spartacus, C, Bad News Bears, or D, The A-Team? And the answer, of course, if you were paying attention five minutes ago, the answer is Spartacus. That's the only film of those that did not have one of Gary's songs in it. So Gary in the Road Rally keynote interviewee's comments got me thinking about success in general and what it looks like for musicians today, what it might look like in the future. And I think that success is easier than ever because it's no longer only a record deal, only a hit record, only a hit song, or nothing at all. It's no longer an either-or, zero-sum game. I decided to Google some quotes about success, and here are some that I like. I don't know if you guys know who Zig Ziglar is, but I think he's maybe like the top-selling car salesman of all time. I know he's certainly done a lot of seminars, sold a lot of books about that. Um... Zig Ziglar says, success means doing the best we can with what we have. Success is the doing, not the getting. It's in the trying, not the triumph. Uh, success is a personal standard. Reaching for the highest that's in us, becoming all that we can be. That's Gary. That could be you. It's no longer about record deal, multi-platinum album. I mean, yeah, those things are great. But, and there's nothing to say that you can't still go for those things. But doing these film and TV things certainly fills in the blanks. Uh, Mark Victor Hansen, who's that best-selling author guy that wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul and about a thousand other books that um, have been you know, a part of that brand. Mark Victor Hansen says, Don't wait until everything is just right. It will never be perfect. There will always be challenges, obstacles, and less than perfect conditions. So what? Get started now. With each step you take, you'll grow stronger and stronger, more and more skilled, more and more self-confident, and more and more successful. Got it? 
So get started now. With each step you take, you'll grow stronger and stronger, more and more skilled, more and more self-confident, and more and more successful. <laughs> I couldn't resist this one, although I'm not sure it's all that applicable, but maybe. <clears throat> I'm going to tickly throat. I need throat lozenges. Uh, Yoda says, Yoda, Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. Do or do not, there is no try. Sorry, tickly throat. Um... Okay, Thomas J. Watson, the chairman of IBM, maybe even the founder of IBM, said, would you like me to give you a formula for success? It's quite simple, really. Double your rate of failure. You're thinking of failure as the enemy of success, but it isn't at all. You can be discouraged by failure or you can learn from it. So go ahead and make mistakes. because Make all you can. Because remember, that's where you'll find... <laughs> I blew that... That's where you'll find success, is in the making of the mistakes. Um, here's a guy, uh, James Allen, who was a British self-help author all the way back in, he died in 1912, so this guy was way ahead of the curve on the self-help things. He says, for true success, ask yourself these four questions. Why? Why do I want to be successful, okay? Why not? Why not me? And why not now? My commentary on that is that a lot of people blow their chances of success in the now part of that list. They can understand the why. They can come up with a why not, um, or, or can't come up with a why not, no good reason for it. Why not me? Well, everybody thinks they deserve success. Why not now? And that's where people get into a long list of reasons. And I like to call those reasons that procrastinate, push things off. They're not reasons. They're excuses. They're BS. They're, uh, you know what? Hold on. Read this book. It's called Do the Work excuse me, by Stephen Pressfield, read this book and you will get past the why not now um, and you will no longer procrastinate, okay? Also read his book, The War of Art. I'm telling you, these two books have changed the lives of so many taxi members that if you don't invest 20 bucks in these books, you're nuts. Don't be nuts. Okay, so let's see. I got past that, the excuses thing. Okay, and here's a quote from Anonymous. Don't know who that is. Wasn't me. It actually said anonymous on the web page. An unfailing success plan. At each day's end, write down the six most important things to do tomorrow. Number them in order of importance and then do them. You know what? Where's my book? You may laugh. You may call me old school. You may call me lo-fi. I still use an at-a-glance calendar. Um, hey, you know what? Trying to do it on your phone, you have to open things up and go to a page and blah, 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 blah. I flip this baby open every day and I see my list right in front of me. Nothing worse, though, than getting into bed. I actually sleep with my um, laptop under the bed, my briefcase leaning up against the nightstand next to the bed, and I can't tell you how many nights I go to bed and this book is going, Mikey, write something in. You forgot something on the list. So this does keep me up at night, but it's very helpful. Okay, um, I'm looking at the, what are you guys talking about in there? Pay attention, damn it. <laughs> I worked really hard on this, 3,900 words are hard. Um, okay, so Anonymous says that at each day's end, write down the six most important things to do tomorrow, number them in order of importance, and then do them. Here's a comment by marketing expert Bob Bly about the people who buy success courses online and then wonder why the course didn't work. And he says, most buyers do not follow the instructions in the course. A surprising number never even read, listen to, or watch the program. Many others study it and then ignore or don't do the actions required. You know what that sounds like to me? Taxi members, not all of them, but some of them. Musicians who don't 
who join Taxi but don't read the listings carefully, members who don't use the feedback they get from the screeners, members who don't use <clears throat> the peer-to-peer -peer section of our forum, members who don't use the two free tickets to our world-class convention, and members who don't watch Taxi TV. And they wonder why they're not successful. And then Gary Srzynski, who plays the accordion and lives geographically as far away as you can get from Los Angeles in America as you could possibly get, and yet <clears throat> he's successful. Hang on. The boss needs to see if he's got his emergency stash of throat lozenges. Yes, he does. All right. You guys are going to have to tolerate me with a throat lozenge slogging around while I do this, but I have a tickle. Okay. Hmm. By the way, if you're bummed out that Glenn Fry from the Eagles died, don't watch the history of the Eagles part one and two. I made the mistake of doing that this weekend. It bummed me out even more. I miss you, Glenn. You were awesome. Okay. So all this made me think even more about taxi members. I feel like such an idiot chewing this thing or sucking on this while I'm talking. This made me think even more about taxi members and their success or the lack thereof. Did you know that 50% of first-year taxi members don't renew because they aren't successful in their first year. Thinking about that in the shifting definition of success in terms of today's music industry got me wondering how are successful members who are successful define success. So I went to the success stories page of the taxi forums and I found these comments. Here's a post from Andy Gabbers who is often in this room, and I hope he's in there today. Hey, Andy, if you are. Um, this is from Andy. Today was the 2015 Q2, meaning second quarter distribution period for BMI, my PRO. It was my biggest royalty payment to date, continuing the upward trend from year to year. I was doing some figuring on what portion of my catalog was getting used and how often, and here's what I discovered. Of the 735 plus registrations I have in my BMI account, all my domestic placements have occurred based on 48 cues slash titles, about 6.5% of my total catalog. So in other words, all the action was coming from 6.5% of his total catalog. Since my first royalty statement in 2010, I've had music in 68 shows domestically and a few more that were placed internationally, covering several hundred episodes and in syndication in 28 countries. What was most interesting analyzing the trend in licensing was that I'm still getting a lot of new placements from the very first library I signed with in 2008. Um, and he says that it uh, took until 2010 to see income. from. So he signed with the library in 20, uh, 2008, saw the income starting to come in in 2010. Um, <coughs> had I only placed one piece with that company, I likely would see no trend at all. But I have over time signed 50 plus cues and more and more get discovered every year and placed. So he's talking about 50 more cues in that library, not just one. So now I'm starting to see the trend to include other libraries and publishers, including the ones from my taxi deals. He started with taxi after 2010. Again, where I've continued to sign music, I'm seeing greater I'm seeing a greater trend of placements. I want to extend my gratitude to Michael Lasco for having the vision to put together what Taxi is today. Thank you. He said thank you, and I thank you. Um, that'd be a very hard thing to accomplish living in New Mexico without the help of Taxi. So um, what I loved about that is... Andy is grateful. He's publicly showing gratitude. Not that he's kissing my butt in public. I, I don't care about that. But he's saying thank you. It's like going to somebody's house and not bring a bottle of wine or flowers, you know? He's no slob. He said thank you. So then there was another post. Uh, the title of it was, if, if it were not for taxi, I would have never gotten my first deal. That's a fact. Because I learned things I didn't know and did not write and produce at the same level. And I still have much to learn and improve before joining taxi. Um, gratitude is an understatement. And that's from Lauren to Georgie. And I think Lauren is in the house today. So thank you, Lauren. Gratitude is very, very common among successful taxi members. They're grateful for the success they have now, no matter what level it's at. So that's what I'm talking about. 
they're grateful, even though, I mean, this gentleman, Lauren DeGiorgi, just got his first deal. Not Mick Jagger. Doesn't fly around in a private jet. Doesn't live in a castle somewhere in the UK. He just got a deal. It's a small thing, but it's not nothing, and he's grateful for it. Here's another one. Taxi Forward becomes, and by the way, these were all posted on the, the front page of the success story part of our online forum at forums with an S, forums.taxi.com. Um, and I didn't pick out the ones that only had complimentary things to say. I just took like every other one or every third one or something and, and copied them and pasted them in this document. So here's one called Taxi Forward Becomes Another Library Deal. I just got off the phone with the list uh, or with the owner of an A-list prestigious music library in Greater LA. Taxi forwarded some of my crime show music to him a while back, and he loved the stuff. Contracts are on the way. On the phone, the owner was telling me that he gets so much music that it takes a lot of time to go through the things that get sent to him. So that's why it took him a couple of months to get to me. I didn't know while on the phone when the cues had been forwarded to him. It's a non-issue for me. After all, he's signing my stuff. But I just looked back at my for looked back in my forwards, and it looks like these were from October and November. You've heard Michael Lasko say it, folks. This is just the way the industry works. Keep making music and getting it out there. Let the rest take care of itself. There's no sense staring at the phone, that's for sure. Thanks, Taxi. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, screener number 53 and screener number 319. I think I may just keep you said tongue-in-cheek, um, by Russell Landwehr. Russell is grateful. All these guys are grateful. They're expressing their gratitude, right? Hey, there's Lauren to Georgie. Hey, Lauren. Um, okay, here's another one. Two instrumental signs. Hi, all. Excited to tell you that I have a couple placements for the undermentioned listings with the library. Taxi listing U151208 BC, Blues Instrumental Cues. Uh, another one, Taxi U151117 uh, TC, Traditional Country. In the November 18th, or um, part of this got cut off, so I filled it back in. When the November 18th newsletter came out, amongst other great info, Michael said this quote, Step one, figure out what you do best and concentrate on only that one thing to start out. Step two, forget about writing songs, at least for now, and concentrate on just doing instrumental cues for the time being, unquote. So I did, and I got those two placements. It works. Thanks to everyone who chimed in with the critiques and advice, and thanks, Taxi, and that's from Steve J. Curtis. Steve is grateful. He's showing his gratitude. Here's another one. Tracking a reality TV show. Thank you, Taxi. Gratitude right up front there. I just wanted to say thank you to Michael and the team at Taxi once again. You guys are dream makers. I found out on December 31st an instrumental track I have in a library uh, was placed in a reality TV show last year in August. Um, and I made money. Not a lot, but that's not the point. My GYAWS, that's Get Your Ass Writing Songs Friend, Jimmy Carvalho, said, it's about validation. Yes, sir, it is, he says. Thanks to my family at Taxi, the best kept secret of the music business, John Colombo. John Colombo is grateful. Okay, got a couple more of these guys. Major Milestone, 1,000 cues signed. And this one is from Matt Vanderbo. Hey, Matt, hope you're watching, dude. Uh, just last night, I submitted a package of tracks to a music library I work with quite regularly, and after inputting them into my spreadsheet, uh, I realized I finally crested the thousand tracks signed milestone. Although I suppose that may be a little misleading, as hundreds of those are non-exclusive signings in which I've retitled the track and counting the same piece multiple times, but still, it's a thousand and one, seven, a thousand and seven unique titles that I got out there. I've got out there working for me, not counting all the alt mixes of each track. If only I had a social life, I'd celebrate. If I remember correctly, Matt Vanderbo has a young child, like a maybe a year old baby, so he's not having much of a social life right now. For those who are interested, it breaks down like this. 568 exclusive tracks, 439 non-exclusive titles. Um, only 20 of them are full-length songs with vocals. The rest are all cues. Whew! You know who or what I can thank for this? Taxi and the Road Rally. 
Those two things have introduced me to some really great libraries and countless great friends, a handful of people who took me under their wing when I was just a newbie and showed me the ropes and helped me figure out this whole thing. The complete taxi experience can truly be life-changing if you embrace it all and keep plugging away. Deep breath, he says. On to the next thousand. Matt Vanderbo. Matt is grateful. Okay, so I, I don't want to... I've got more of these things, but... I don't want you to, you know what, I didn't go search these things out that all said taxi is wonderful, taxi is great. This is not a commercial for taxi. It's to simply make a point for you guys. Um, I'm actually doing pretty well on time. So, all right, I'm going to read you one long one. All right, this one's from Robbie Hancock. Um, music Library Song Placement and Progress Review. One of my songs, co-written by Amanda Anderson, has been placed in three non-exclusive music libraries over the past few weeks. Great addition to the holidays. Thanks again to those who helped me out and commented on its production journey in P2P, meaning the peer-to-peer -peer section of the Taxi Forum, and GYAWS for the inspiration. Um, here's the final version. It's called One Side of the Sun. Our Side of the Sun, sorry. I also just wanted to mention, after reviewing my own progress here since joining Taxi, I am definitely starting to see progress. I just want to take a—I uh, just want to break it down for myself and share some of the newer, share with some of the newer members to show how important it is to really read and write to the listings, and more importantly, stick with it. The following also emphasizes how important returns are, and that they should not be dismissed; they should be printed and studied. That became a big part of my contemporary music education. Kudos to taxi member James Koshin here as well as for his encouraging me to do this. Thank you also to the screeners for not crushing my dreams on those initial submissions to LOL. Here's what I discovered. In 2013, he made 81 submissions, got three forwards and 78 returns. So his ratio is one out of 27 for the forwards. Not that good. Not horrible, I've heard worse. Um, 2014, he only made 37 submissions because he realized, Robbie realized that he probably had new memberitis. People get very excited and start taking pot shots at a lot of stuff when they first join, and they get very discouraged when they don't get forwarded. They're not getting forwarded. Be, it's not happening because they're terrible. It's happening because most often they're submitting the wrong thing for the wrong listing. And they eventually calm down, like Robbie did in his next year, 2014, with only 37 submissions. And then he got six forwards and 31 returns. So all of a sudden, his ratio went from 1 in 27 to 1 in 6. Then, in 2015, he was starting to feel a little better, a little more confident. He'd been around. He'd been to the road rally. He has friends that are, you know, lots of friends that are taxi members. He made 45 submissions, got 11 forwards and 34 returns. Now his ratio is 1 in 4. He's got a 25% forward ratio. That's really good. Um... Okay, so in 2013, I submitted the most with the lowest ratio forwards. Looking at my history and remembering my thought process, I rarely wrote to the listing and more often than not submitted what I'd already recorded over and over again. A lot of people make that mistake and then they end up hating us for it. Not only that, but I would submit my music to any genre that sounded even close to what I'd already had in hopes that they would just take it. Hmm, sound familiar anybody? Not pointing fingers at anybody in particular, you know what I mean. Um, let's see, duh, LOL, he says, from the, the numbers, this obviously was a tough year and I would have given up if not for the help of the forum, taxi TV, and my first road rally. Common thread, right? A huge thank you to those members in the beginning who took the time to help me and point me in the right direction. Gratitude. 2014, I started to get it. I adopted the mantra of write, submit, forget, and repeat. I watched every episode of Taxi TV and all the archives. Wow, good job on that. And really read my returns. Uh, he means his feedback from the returns. And more importantly, started really reading the listings and listening to all the reference tracks. This was huge for me. I more than halved my submissions, cut them in half, um, and my forward to return ratio improved dramatically. It's also the year that I got my first film placement and library deal. Just saying. In 2015, I have a one to four re uh, forward to return ratio, and that's something I'm very proud of. It means I'm totally improving and getting better at making contemporary music for today's industry. 
It means I'm learning from my returns, as hard as it might be at times, for someone to tell you that your babies are ugly, LOL. Uh, on the way to the 2014 road rally, I was sitting on a plane next to a businessman who was a marketing sales guy for a corporation. He was such a good person. After I told him where I was going and what I was trying to accomplish, he simply said, fail fast. He was right. Get over it. Move on. Work on something else and learn to write, submit, forget, and repeat as passed down from senior members here on the forum. Not saying that they are old, the members he means. Write, submit, forget, and repeat. There you go. That's the mantra. Thank you, Stephen Giles, for printing these little suckers. Okay. Mojo Bone agrees, says, fail fast. Absolutely. The more frequently you the fa that you fail, the better you will become, and the more quickly you will become better. Um, let's see. Thanks to taxi members, staff, screeners, returns, and, and through the community, I've signed my music to 15 libraries in the U.S. and Canada and just received my first international placement in 2015, a collaboration with another member, Andy Gabris, uh, who was one of my first mentors here on the forum. None of this would have happened if I had not joined Taxi. I also had my first deal from a Taxi Forward in 2015. Success to me is learning from my mistakes and failing fast. It takes a lot of determination to, a to be able to keep failing and see it as a positive step forward. I wanted to share my story for those that are struggling at the beginning like I was. Never give up, never surrender. I'm, pretty f I'm a pretty friendly member, so feel to reach. Sorry. Pretty friendly member, so feel free to reach out if you want some advice, some fresh ears, or just a new taxi pal. Thank you so much, Michael Lasko, for changing my life. I can see this is going to be a fun ride. All the best for 2016, and that's from Robbie Hancock. Yet another person showing gratitude. A lot of gratitude. Thank you, Robbie. So, what these people seem to have in common, and, and they're just a tiny fraction of the folks in the success story form. I mean, we've got like, I don't know, somewhere around 50 pages or more of these things. And on those 50 pages of stories like this, they represent only a tiny little fraction of all of our members and our successful members. Most people don't take the time to post their success stories. Um, anyway, even though they're a tiny fraction, um, these people have expressed similar feelings, and that is that they understand that success comes in all shapes and all sizes, and the definition of success for them, for them, not Mick Jagger, seems to be slicing off one piece of that salami at a time rather than expecting to eat the whole damn thing in one gulp. Take it a slice at a time. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not even going there. Um, they understand that constant learning, patience, feedback, and forward momentum all come with time and work. They've set realistic goals and they use their failures as learning opportunities. And each success is motivation to reach for yet bigger goals, right? So success could be here and then you reach to the next goal and succeed there. Got it? Got it. Um, the other thing they all seem to have in common, and you should know those forum posts were picked at random and in a hurry. Um, the other thing that I noticed after pasting those comments into my notes here is that all those people sharing their success stories, every one of them expressed gratitude. Every one of them. So, much has been said about the attitude of gratitude. Here are a couple of thoughts <clears throat> from a successful entrepreneur, investor, and uh, business columnist named Adam Torin. He says, gratitude is contagious. I can't speak for you, but I personally don't like being in business with jerks. Who does? I don't like whiners, complainers, or otherwise unpleasant to be around people. There are too many smart, talented, and pleasing to be around people uh, in this world for me to want to work or hire the ones that aren't. Duh. When you're grateful, you tend to exude and share that contagious, positive energy. People like me like that, and we tend to be drawn to you, okay? Our energy is contagious. I'm still quoting him, by the way. And we do good things together and are better for having come together. So, I completely agree. I think Mr. Torrin is so right. I know so many publishers in this industry who've personally told me how important it is for them to work 
uh, with artists and composers that they like as people. Do you think that they like those taxi members I just read the forum post from? Hell yes. Why? Because they're grateful. They appreciate stuff. And they're probably, they reciprocate when, you know, they get a nice note from a publisher. I got a placement for you. I'm sure they send a nice note back. Thank you so much. It's good. It cuts both ways. So to sum this all up, the definition of success in the music business is no longer the platinum record or the huge hit song for every musician. That might still be the top of the ladder. But success is also the journey and not just the destination. Success is not a one-size-fits-all thing anymore. It's a different thing for different people and at different times in their lives. One thing seems obvious to me, and that is the definition of success shifts with each new step of the ladder. Every step you climb is success. All right? Learning from mistakes and failures, that's success. Crafting a piece of music that's better than the last one you made, that's success. Getting that piece of music forwarded by Taxi's A&R staff, that's success. Being offered a deal from a publisher after being forwarded, definitely a success. Getting a placement with your music, absolutely a success. Getting a lot of placements with your music, success, no question about it. Earning enough income from getting so many placements with your music that you can quit doing what you don't like and begin earning your living doing what you love, that is success. So success is the entire ladder, not just the top rung. Success is just doing it. Failure, on the other hand, is doing nothing. I'm going to read you these two quotes from Zig Ziglar, Zig Ziglar and Mark Hansen again before I wrap this up. Zig Ziglar says, Success means doing the best we can with what we have. Success is the doing, not the getting. It's the trying, not the triumph. Success is a personal standard reaching for the highest that is in us, learning to be all that we can be. Mark Victor Hansen, the guy who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul and a million other best-selling books, says, don't wait until everything is just right. You know, that's the classic, well, I've been thinking about joining Taxi now for years. I've been reading Michael's emails and following you guys for like a decade. Why haven't you joined yet? Well, I'm waiting until I've got the right music. Ten years from now, that person is still going to be waiting to have the right music when they've missed out on 10 or 20 years of failing fast, getting education vis-a-vis -vis the critiques, um, the peer-to-peer -peer stuff in the forum, going to the road rally, watching taxi TV. They've missed out on all that stuff. And 10 or 20 years down the road, where are they? Exactly no further than they were when they started because they didn't put one foot in front of the other because they were waiting for everything to be perfect. So there will always be challenges, obstacles, and less than perfect conditions. So what? Get started now. With every step you take, you'll grow stronger and stronger and more and more skilled, more and more self-confident, and more and more successful. And there you have it. Yay. All right. Um, let's look at some questions because I see some popping up here. Um, question. How, this is from Vicki Flowers. How do I listen to the Allahs effectively? Ooh. I just scrolled off the screen. Uh, it seems to fall short of the mark sometimes. I'm not sure if I'm hearing what I should. Um, I don't understand the question, Vicki. I don't know what you mean. It seem, I seem to fall short of the mark sometimes. Um, I don't know. We'd spend an inordinate amount of time. Either we get those referenced um, artists, the Allahs, as Vicky's calling them, and they are commonly called throughout the industry. We get those from the people who give us the listings and request the music. Um, they'll usually give us one, maybe two, and we will develop it into two or three or four or five. Um, we spend a ton of time, um, and, and usually it, it's at least a couple of people that are bouncing the ideas off of each other, you know, so we've got like a backup system to make sure that we're giving you guys good references. Here's the deal. This is maybe the most important thing to know about the references that are in the taxi listings, and that is... It's extremely rare that they're looking for a sound-alike or a replacement. 
Most of the time when we give you three references, and you may listen to them and go, I don't get it. This first one is mid-tempo and has a female singing, and yeah, it's indie pop. Uh, the second one is more up-tempo and has a guy singing, but different instrumentation, and it's just faster, a little more frenetic feeling, and it's got a chorus of unison male vocals in it. And then the third one is like a duet with a guy and a girl singing and harmony vocals in it. I don't know which one of these is indie pop. The point is they're all indie pop. And what the company's looking for is not something that sounds like the first reference, the second reference, or the third reference. What they're looking for is would the music you're submitting for this listing be something <clears throat> that a fan of those three songs or those three acts would also like? Would they put it on the same playlist with that? Would it be on the same radio station playlist or the same chart as those acts? If the answer is yes, then probably you should submit it. Now, if using that indie pop reference, if the music you've got sounds more like Neil Diamond, it's like that Sesame Street thing, you know, which one of these does not belong or whatever it is. A Neil Diamond thing or a Celine Dion thing or a Barbra Streisand thing is not going to be included on a playlist with those indie pop acts. So that's what we're doing. We're just showing you. It's kind of a range. It's not that they're looking for stuff that sounds just like that. I mean, you may say, oh, I've got something that sounds like that. Great. I mean, again, not a clone. But, you know, I've got a mid-tempo female thing that sounds like indie pop, um, has kind of the same texture and attitude. So yeah, you should probably submit that thing. Hope that helps. Um, Andy Gabber says, very inspiring show. Thanks, uh, and thank you for putting that stuff on, on the forum, Andy. Seriously, you guys have no idea how much it means to me personally, how much it means to the staff, to the screeners, um, maybe most importantly to your fellow members. Um, not enough people post in the success story thing. Come on. We all know that the PROs just uh, put out their statements. I think one or two people posted. I'm sure that hundreds, if not a couple of thousand members, went, wow, when they looked at their statements and that the vast majority of those placements that showed up on their um, PRO statements were a result of getting forwards to libraries through taxi or getting forwarded directly to supervisors through taxi, and yet they don't post this stuff. Hundreds, if not a couple of thousand people, have that information, and only a couple bothered to post online. So thank you to those guys. Um, Mark Doyle says, I do about 300 gigs a year. Wow, my hat is off to you, sir. Um, love to be able to cut back if I got some forward to the libraries. Well, do what James Koshin, one of our more articulate members on, on the art of getting better. And James says he got dramatically better by going on to the forward section of the forum, which is right above success stories. And he would look for other people that got forwarded to listings that he did not. And then he would try to, his damnedest to listen objectively to their thing versus his thing and go, okay, if I were in the seat of that person in a taxi screening that music, what was it about theirs that worked while well, reading the listing, of course? And what was it about mine that made mine not as right for the listing as theirs? And frankly, your piece could have been better than the one that got forwarded. But being great and not right is not awesome. Okay, you need to be great and right. Sometimes you can be right on target for the genre or that particular request and be a minus E and still get a forward because being right and applicable is sometimes even better than being amazing because amazing and not really right ain't that good. All right. Um, <laughs> Fluffer Puff says, I'm waiting to get my bail money back. <laughs> uh, there's Robbie Hancock. Hey, Robbie, thank you for that nice piece. I appreciate you posting that in the forum a lot. Um, Mojo Bone says, if you wait till you have the right music, it'll already be out of date. Good point. Great point. Um, 
<laughs> Jim Carvalho says, Michael for president. No, thank you. No, not even a chance. Um, All right, uh, Polly is saying, Vicky, what I learned at the rally about the Allahs is listen to all of them and find out what they have in common, then shoot for that. Don't try to copy one of them specifically. Absolutely true. Um, Bob LaGrasso says you have to collaborate. It certainly helps. Um, Fadeout44 says for sure it was a great show. Thank you. Um, Russell Landwehr says, having the goals of taxi listings is a great kick in the butt. Love to kick your butt. Thanks, Russell. Can always count on you to provide me a butt to kick. Um, the Element uh, says, taxi is like a school. You know, so many people look at us and go, oh, taxi, I heard your music has to be perfect, you know, and it's got to be like chart ready, you know, wonderful music to get a forward. They, they're missing the point. Taxi is not only a company that gives you access, it's a company that gets you ready for when the access is staring you in the face. So don't look at it as something that's an either or, gotta have it right now, today, or I shouldn't join proposition. Almost all of these successful guys whose stuff I quoted in these 11 pages and who are in the forum or in the chat room right now, they will all tell you that they weren't ready when they joined and that the combined education of the resources that Taxi provides the road rally, the, the taxi TV, the forum, the peer-to-peer -peer thing, uh, the feedback from the screeners. You put it all together, and that's what gets you good enough to start hitting home runs. Um, okay, I'm going to scroll down because I'm getting lost. Uh, just submitted, Reox says, just submitted my first listing. I'm excited either way, just excited to get started. That's a great attitude. Um Let's see. John Colombo says, get the vibe. Um, it's all in the vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not exactly. Right. Mojo says, my reference earlier to Sesame Street is one of these things is not like the others. Yep. Um Yeah, can I just, uh, boy, this is a tough one, but I'm going to tackle it. Um, WCSD producer one says, can you define the difference between broadcast quality and a great sounding home recording? Frankly, they can both be the same thing. Um, broadcast quality, uh, I've done entire shows on this, I think it's several times, and we've got all kinds of stuff on the website about it. There is no exact definition for broadcast quality. I will tell you that it used to be either studio quality or demo quality. But in the film and TV world, they need something that's ready to go right now that they can put on the air, or at least very soon. So they don't want to hear a demo and go, ooh, I love this song. This would work great for my TV show. And then call you up and go, hey, dude, I love this song you've got, but um, I can't use a demo. So can you go re-record it and then get me a mix back in 24 hours? That's not going to happen. Most of the time, people will not pull that off. And, and they just need to go with the bird in hand versus the two in the bush. So... Um, they want something that is better than demo quality, but probably doesn't, in some or many cases, need to be like an amazing, you know, done in a multi-million dollar studio quality. What they need is something that's cleanly recorded, wonderfully performed as far as the hands, you know, and the performances of the musicians, um, and captures a vibe and creates an emotion or helps support an underlying emotion in a scene. And broadcast quality is all that stuff. Broadcast quality could be, and I've used this example many, many times, could be a six string guitar with 10 year old strings that are even rusty on it. And the guitar doesn't sparkle and sound great like those Paul Reed Smith guitars at the Road Rally. It sounds like that $100 Stella your parents got you for your 13th birthday or something. Sounds like crap, but you know what? You take that really crappy sounding guitar with the rusty strings and a Tom Waits, you know, gravelly, smoky, I had a few too many uh, shots of Jack last night, gravelly voice, and you put that together with the song about being down and out 
and there's a little pitchiness, maybe a lot of pitchiness in the vocal, and maybe a little bit of off tuning um, or bad tuning on the guitar. You put that all together, any one of those things would be enough to knock it out of contention most of the time. But if you were looking for a song about being down and out on your last legs, you've given up all hope, and it's a moody, introspective, like, holy crap, what do I do with my life now kind of scene in the movie, you don't want it to sound slick and sparkly and amazing, right? You don't want it to sound like an Eagle song. You want it to sound like Tom Waits. So in that case, broadcast quality would be a rusty six-string guitar recorded semi-poorly. I mean, decently, you know, I mean, it's got to sound, it's got to Got to have some bottom and some top. Should have a little compression on it so it's not blowing your speakers up if somebody hits a, a big spiky chord. But it's not about it's not about engineering all the time. It's about sounding right for the application, and that is largely dictated by the alas. If you hear a bunch of alas that sound, you know, the references that we give you. And, and they sound rough and tumble and rugged and rusty stringed and gravelly voiced, don't send in something that's light and pretty and delicate and happy. That makes it not broadcast quality. So it's not always about the audio. It's about the whole thing. Hope that helps. Um, <laughs> Polly says, good thing the pop-up ad is all about Vaseline. I could use some the way my browser is treating me. Uh, I'm not even going down there. Uh, yeah, Mojo says, there's several taxi episodes on broadcast quality. There are. Um, John Colombo makes a really good point. He says, yeah, another thing I've learned is not just listen for the instrumentation, but also listen for the instruments that are not in the alas. Don't, just because you can doesn't mean you should. You guys have heard me say that a thousand times. Don't put everything in there just because you can hear a part. I'm telling you, when in doubt, simple is better. When in doubt, understated is better. When in doubt, never try and show a music supervisor or a music library that you're a frigging genius at anything. They don't want genius guitar players. They don't want genius composers. They want people that understand what the job of a piece of music is. And that job is almost always to support a scene in a TV show, movie, commercial, video game, what have you. It's not the star, it's the background. A lot of times it's so far in the background, you feel it more than you actually hear it, which I think is ironic when they do run these listings. Of course, all the libraries say, give us broadcast quality. Uh, and then the stuff is mixed so low, who the hell could tell? But you know what? A decent balance. If, if it's got too much bottom, it's kind of like this. That's not broadcast quality, right? But if it's like that and it's really sibilant, that's not broadcast quality either. This is broadcast quality, even though I'm using you know, a, a relatively inexpensive, um, uh, whatever you call those cameras with a built-in microphone. You know, uh, it's, it sounds like me. I've listened to the shows. Sounds pretty much like me. That's broadcast quality. Um, okay, I need to scroll down. I'm still stuck on people talking about broadcast quality. Um, how good do music cues need to be? When does perfecting a track begin to have diminishing returns? Um, almost always. The people who are out there making money doing this will tell you, write, submit, record, or write, submit, write, record, submit. Yeah, that. Here, write, submit, forget, repeat. Um, if you're spending, you know, more than a few hours or a day, an evening on a queue, you've probably spent too much time. And start out simply. You've heard me say this a thousand times. Go for, if you're a guitar player, start out with just twangy acoustic guitar stuff that would work on Duck Dynasty. One acoustic guitar doing whole notes, strums. Another one may be doing some finger picking pan them opposite each other, and maybe a slide dobro down the middle. 
Here, undo it like that. Slide Dobro. It looks better going sideways. You know what I'm saying. Slide Dobro, okay? Um, or maybe a little banjo. But don't try and show them that you're the best banjo picker in the world because it's going to be too busy and it's going to distract from the dialogue. It's going to distract from the action in the scene. Your music needs to tell the viewers subconsciously almost where are, are you in Paris? That would be an accordion or a concertina, concertina playing something as you're standing on a bridge looking out over the Seine at the Eiffel Tower off in the distance, right? What if you were in a cantina in Mexico on a blazing hot day? What would you hear there? If you were in a movie about a nightclub um, with a bunch of gorgeous women in sexy dresses and guys in expensive suits driving beautiful cars. And these are the beautiful, rich, cocaine-starting, alcohol-drinking, vapid people that go to clubs. Um, what would you hear in that club? What about uh, a swanky uh, restaurant, a fine dining restaurant? You'd probably hear a string quartet playing gently in the background. So all those things do is set you up for a place and a time and a mood. The music, nobody is going to pay, the atten pay attention to the music like you will. But the person who is putting the music in the show, even though it really almost sadly doesn't count in a lot of cases, if they're given 10 final options, they're going to pick the best option, not the least good one. And the best option is the one that works best in the scene. And there's just no way for you or the taxi screener or for me or for anybody but the supervisor to know what works best against picture. And ultimately, the supervisor is going to play it for the show's producer and find out if they're right. So even the supervisor has to deal with somebody above them going, yeah, not so fast. Um, Uh, Timber Tim wants to know, with respect to the cues, would it not be possible to obtain an image or snippet of the video that would allow us to create music that supports the video? No. Um, can you imagine NBC giving us a piece of, uh, I'm not even sure what network, I think the Blacklist is on NBC. Can you imagine them giving us a scene from next week's episode of the Blacklist and letting us send it out to you know, 10,000 people or 100,000 people or even one person? No. I mean, the guy who's scoring the show, yes, because he's a trusted member of the inner circle. He's not going to share that with anybody. But they can't, this stuff is proprietary. It's The episode is a secret till it airs. Um, TV commercials. Same thing. They don't want to take a chance on, uh, if you're working on a Nike commercial, they don't want Reebok seeing it. So they're not going to give it to thousands of musicians so they can end up in the hands of Reebok and Reebok can then go call their um, ad agency and say, we need a, a TV commercial like that. We need it in a week and we need it to be on that theme, but better. So let's go kick Reebok's uh, or Nike's ass. No, they keep this stuff private. Um, Okay, scrolling down to get caught up again. Um, yeah, I am on a delay to the chat. I'm, I'm skipping a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I do my banjo on my keyboard, and it's a boatload of work to make it sound real. But you know what, Wadi? That's what it takes, because they can hear a MIDI-sounding banjo that doesn't have the right articulations and stuff. They can spot that a mile away. They want stuff that sounds real. Frankly, for... It, a Gitanjo, a Guitar Center, is cheap. I mean, those things, I was shocked. I want to say they're like $189. Buy a Gitanjo. I mean, if you can play even the most basic finger-picking stuff on a guitar, get a Gitanjo and do it for real. If you can't, then work really hard on those samples. Um, all right. Uh, Okay, we're now, to, uh, right, Martin J. Frog says even the ap actors are kept in the dark. <laughs> I think a lot of them stay in the dark. Um, Polly says, with repetition comes speed. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what his wife tells him. Look, th there is no better way 
to become a successful taxi member, and I'm talking about any level of success on that ladder, um, just doing it. So many people find excuses to not do it, and they stop dead in their tracks, and they end up doing nothing at all. They're right where they were. Just do it and plan on failing. Know that you're going to fail. So what? I mean, every time you sat down as a kid with a coloring book and you colored, if you went outside the lines, did you burn the coloring book or throw it away and never color again? No. All right. Uh, does the Q, does the word Q denote any given length? Generally, generalization, because most things are, no hard, fast, exact rules, but generally speaking, Qs are like between a minute and three minutes. We often, if a company tells us, I don't know, which they do sometimes, we use two minutes as the default. That's a good safe amount of time. If it's too short, then they have to loop it too much and there's not enough variation in it to keep it interesting. If it's too long, not the world's worst thing. They can always edit it down. But, you know, they're looking for an arc. Here's a little advice. Within a queue, and let's say that you've got something that's 90 seconds or two minutes. Um, so, sorry, this is a lot of repetition for a lot of you old timers, but they don't want a 35 second intro. Nobody can use that. They're looking for your cue to be one thing and one thing only. And generally speaking, a cue is an A section. Sometimes it's an A and a B section. The A section, generally speaking, is kind of like the chorus of a song. It's the red meat. It's the heart of the matter. So, yeah, you could have a two-bar intro, or you could have kabam, bam, boom, right into it, or you could just start completely and utterly right on the first note of bar one of what would be a chorus and get right into it. And then two bars, four bars, eight bars later, um, let's say you start out with two acoustic guitars, one just doing brown whole note arpeggiated strums and the other one doing nice lazy finger picking. And then four bars into it, you introduce the first slide guitar part. And then another four bars into it, maybe you introduce um, a shaker. And then you break it down and bring it just back to uh, the two acoustic guitars. And then you build it back up again. Um, by adding those other instruments back in. And the second time you build it up, maybe you bring in a fourth or fifth instrument instead of just a shaker. Maybe you bring in a tambourine hit. Or maybe you double the guitar part, you know, on the whole note strums. And then you kind of build it up, up, up to a brum ending. That's what we talk about. We talk about a non-faded um, uh, buttoned or stinger ending. It's, you know, just ending on the root note, a chord, let it ring out, and you're done. So there you go. Um, hopefully that helped. Um, let's see. Uh, if it's an actual song, it should be a full song form, about 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Absolutely true. Um, Yep, a Gitanjo, Polly. They've got them at Guitar Center. Uh, Wadi JP says he got a forward for a hip hop trap that had a keyboard banjo. Awesome. Um, a banjitar, yep, I've seen him called that as well. All right. Uh, I'm scanning very quickly. I'm going to take a couple more questions and let's wrap it up. Um, <laughs> um, WCSD producer one says I spent a lot of trying time, a lot of time trying to emulate a tambourine and decided to just buy one and record it with a mic. Brilliant. Yes, that is brilliant. You know what? For 20, 30 bucks, go buy a tambourine and just remember. Don't put it right up against the mic. Keep it like six inches to two feet away from the mic. Frankly, um, probably better off using a dynamic mic because tambourines have a ton of transients in them. Uh, use a high-pass filter because you don't need any bottom end on a tambourine. If you do a bottom end in there, it's just going to be air conditioning, room rumble. Um, you may even get the sound of the hand going thunk, thunk. Maybe you want that sometimes. Um, and depending on the type of thing you're Putting it in, sometimes compress the hell out of the tambourine. Other times, don't. But real tambourines rock. 
Um, and there are some frequencies, lower mids, that you can roll off a little bit. And that will cause you, by subtractive EQ, to not add top end, which will make the tambourine cause your ears to bleed. Um, scroll, Man, you guys are firing off the questions so quack, so quick. Uh, Jesse's got to go. i got to go in a minute, too. Um, Wadi JP says, really hard to not put a B section in a two-minute cue, but the more you do, the easier it gets. You know, sometimes you can put a B section in there. Here's the problem with the B sections. Think of a B section as like a bridge, okay? The A section is like a chorus. B section would be kind of equivalent to a song's bridge. The supervisors and the editors have one emotion, generally speaking, in a scene. And if they have two emotions, they're going to use two pieces of music. They don't expect that your one piece of music that's two minutes long is going to time out wonderfully to, here's emotion A, and now, oh, look at that, this other section, the B section, which is like a bridge, happens to line up perfectly with the right mood and the right emotion and the right timing for this other emotion we've got in the same scene where it goes from happy to bemused or confused. So it's just better to stick to one thing. And they'll go to another piece of music. Um, don't try and score anything um, with the cue. Generally speaking, a cue is, is a transition, used for a transition, or it's used as wallpaper in the background. Sometimes they're looking for something that sounds like um, a classic rock song or uh, Southern rock to be playing in the back of a, you know, a roadhouse um, bar with peanuts on the floor, or peanut shells on the floor, and a bunch of bad guys in there, and there's a jukebox 100 feet away, and pool tables. The sound of the pool, the balls on the pool table clacking against each other will generally be louder in the mix than the music off in the distance. So what, just watch TV and look at those scenes and go, what do they need there? Um, Sometimes they, they want a full song, not just a cue for background source music. That was my point. I forgot to mention it. Is they want a full song that's got like an intro and a verse and a chorus um, and a bridge because they want it to sound like a radio hit playing on that jukebox far away. But they're not going to spend 20 grand to get a radio hit or 50 grand or whatever. Um, you know, they're going to want to drop a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks to get something that sounds like, gee, that sounds, you know, if you listen hard, that sounds like it could have been a hit, but I don't really know what that band is. That's what they're looking for. Um, in those cases, for background source, music source, meaning coming out of a source like a jukebox. All right, one more question, then I'm calling it a night. Um, Polly says he found several band guitars on eBay for about 200 bucks. Yep. Um... Martin Frog says, I've gotten some cool sounds with kitchen utensils and oatmeal cartons. Absolutely. Um, I was just with my friend um, Adam Zelkind on Saturday. And that guy is, you know, he's like ASCAP's number one TV composer for eight years running or something. Um, he is a world-class TV composer, mostly for reality shows, but does a lot of other stuff and writes songs at a very high level. And he's famous for using anything. I mean, he'll, you know, he'll take a sneaker and pound it on a desk and sample it and tweak it or take two spoons on his cheeks uh, or take a garbage can lid or, you know, a pressure cooker, bounce his kid's head off the wall, whatever it takes. Adam will try all kinds of organic things, sample them, pitch them up, pitch them down, compress the hell out of them, and, and add them together and try and make really cool sounds out of them. Uh, got myself, uh, let's see, Russell says, Michael, I've got myself into a situation where I have more work to do than I can manage, and I'm laying myself thin, and I feel like I'm losing my successful momentum by not focusing. Um, I can tell you exactly what to do, Russell. Um... I can't remember which one of our members said it. Maybe it was in one of the interviews. Could have been you. I, I know you did a great interview for the passenger profile in the taxi transmitter. By the way, if you guys don't take the time to read the articles in the taxi transmitter, you don't know what you're missing. It's like this, but in print, and you can read it at your own leisure. Anyway, whichever member that was. Oh, I know who it was. Um, oh, God, I'm drawing a total blank. Um 
the wonderful woman who was our um, John Brahaney Award winner this year. Why am I not remembering her name? I just saw her picture over the weekend. Lydia. Okay, Lydia Ashton says the secret for her to solving that problem is by not saying yes to everything. Okay, now, if I may add something that's going to sound really self-serving, but it's not, and that is don't say yes to everything. Don't say yes to every collaboration. Um, a lot of times when you get enough pieces in a library, the, the music library owner will add you to a list of favorite composers or favored composers, composers they trust to meet deadlines and not screw up submissions and such. And they will start to send you stuff um, directly telling you what they need all the time. The problem is, is that people are chasing that. It's like chasing the dragon, you know, smoking heroin. You're always chasing that dragon. In the end, you end up with so many pieces, so many eggs in that one basket because you're constantly chasing that list that they're sending you because you feel so special and you don't want them to not like you because you're not responding. Trust me, they've got a hundred other people that are responding. They've got 500 people or a thousand people that are on that list. It's not just 12 people. So they won't miss you if you're not submitting to a lot of those things. And what you're missing is opportunities. We have just added, like, I think three new libraries in the last, what's today, the 25th, 26th, 25th. So in the first 25 days of the new year, I believe that we've added three great new libraries that I would be willing to bet that none of our members have music in yet. These are, one of them is a library that's been around for like 40, 50 years. And not that many people know about them. But these guys are a venerable A-list library. Um, and so by chasing the dragon on trying to be, you know, one of 50 or 100 or 500 or 1,000 people all submitting when a library says, we need this kind of music, you're missing out on opportunities to spread your bets and get your eggs in other great baskets. Don't fall for the my publisher syndrome where you get where you, just because somebody shows you some love and makes you feel so good and so validated and so important and then they get you a placement, you feel like, you know, that's your publisher. Trust me, they're your publisher today and they may very well be great people. I know m most of them personally and they are. A lot of them are great people. Some of them are close friends of mine. But if they were in your shoes, they would not put all their music in just one or two libraries. I'm convinced the trick is to get your stuff in 10 libraries or more. And we've got three new libraries running listings with Taxi just so far this month in 2016. I think that you're going to see a dramatic uptick in the number of great opportunities coming into Taxi very soon. We're doing some new stuff behind the scenes that is bringing in some even better listings and more of them. So if you are constantly one of those many people chasing that same thing, you're going to end up having a lot of your music in one library or two libraries or three libraries, and they all have their ups and downs. They have periods where they win and periods where they lose. You want to spread your bets. And just know, if Taxi's running listings for the library, it's a good library. Sometimes they're great libraries. Sometimes they're incredibly great libraries. Um, all right, guys, I am going to call it a night. Um, Thank you so much for watching. Um, I put a lot of work into this over the weekend, and uh, I, I, it makes me feel good. This is like when you guys create a queue that gets picked up by a library. I love it when I get a good turnout for a show and where people are really engaged and paying attention. And I just hope that you follow this advice. You know, it comes from the heart. I don't make a penny more if you listen to this stuff or you don't. I just want our members to be successful. There are a lot of shyster companies out there that are taking money from people for fake listings, and it breaks my heart. So I feel like it's our job to always be the company that rises, you know, that we're the guys that get it right for you. So there you go. Have a great week, and I will be back next week with another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. See you then, guys. Bye-bye.